We're tired of doing the same thing over and over. When someone asks that question, they're actually saying, I'm bored. This is not fun. And so come back to the beginning of, of our conversation. If you make it fun, kids will sit down and play the same video game days on end. It's the same thing. When am I going to play a new video game? No, they're enjoying that game because there is variation as they progress. Hello and welcome to the Martial Arts Lifestyle. This is episode number 43. I am James Cox and we are honored and privileged to have a very special guest with us today, Mr. Jeremy Lesniak. Hopefully I'm saying that last name right. I said it right. So the faster I say it, the better it is, right? It's like, like speak, speaking a foreign language, just roll with it, roll it off your tongue. But uh, he is with the Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. And this is one of the top martial arts podcasts uh, in the world from, from what I've seen. I think started back in 2015. Uh, a lot about the traditional martial arts and martial arts in general. So I think what will add some good value and content with our episode today for these listeners is starting off with Mr. Jeremy. Tell us a little bit about you know, your martial arts journey, the podcast, and the whole vision of what you do. Sure. Um, I started training when I was four. And as I've heard my instructors say a couple times since then, after me, they didn't take anybody under six. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I was a bit of a handful, but starting that young really set the tone for my life and my love for martial arts and for training. And as time went on, I realized that not all martial arts schools are the same that I was incredibly blessed with my initial experience and it it left me not I think wanting is too strong of a word but wondering what other people were finding and doing and thinking when it came time to launch Whistlekick as a brand it wasn't focused on content it wasn't the podcast it was protective equipment which grew out of some personal frustrations I, uh, I, I, we talked a little bit before we started going to training for a while, and there were certain products within the martial arts space that I thought were getting worse. And I said, that's ridiculous and set out to change that. We launched our, our protective equipment line and put it out to the world and expected, you know, it's going to work. And if you've watched Field of Dreams, you know that sometimes you got to do a lot more than just have a thing. <laughs> People aren't just going to come around and internally we which I, I always use the we to because there it's much more than me now but at the time it was really just me and i said what do i do how do i get the word out there and podcast i was listening to podcasts i was aware of podcasts and there were only a couple podcasts at, at, at the time in the martial arts space and i reached out to one of them and said i want to sponsor you and they said okay and it never happened um, and i went okay well shoot i, I guess i got to do it myself we put all the pieces in place. I had a friend lined up to host. He was a, a very gregarious uh, person, would have been perfect. And then he went and had a stroke and nearly died. Mm. And he's doing okay now, but shout out to Glenn. And I said, you know, it's still a good idea. I'm just out of people. So I said, I'll do it myself. And that's kind of a recurring theme in my life and in my business mm -hmm. life that if I see something that needs to get done, I'm going to do it. And here we are. We are in our eighth year. I just recorded intros and outros for, I think, 764 earlier today. Uh, you know, you, you, you made a comment. I don't, I don't know that we're, we're one of the best, but we're certainly one of the most prolific. I think at this point it would be hard unless we stop for people to catch up, unless they go daily. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's right. not it's just about let's just keep going let's do the best we can let's put the best stuff out there but at the same time i love and support everybody doing because i think you know rising tide and all that mm -hmm. yeah that's awesome man well congratulations i appreciate it. i mean this is our 43rd 43 episodes so we're, we're, we're still new on this podcast space and my goal was just to kind of add some value and and brand and you know just just be out there i mean you know, of course, I come from doing so much uh, pre-internet, so it's quite different now that we have the ability to be all over the world, you know, and to affect a, a, a lot of numbers. So what I'm hearing from you, your experience and your success and where you go is that stick 
to itness and and perseverance comes to mind i mean man you started when you were three years old see i was 15 and i thought i was young and i've been doing it ever since you know 37 years straight full time it's all i've done but ages three so we, we teach ages three and four it took me a while to do that you know kind of kind of like that i come up to a, a i come from a little more traditional martial arts style that that was originally geared for adults only and then we started mm. teaching teens thank god because that's when i started and then younger kids and then you know man we're Five to seven year olds was enough. Were we ever going to start a three to four year old tiny chip type program? I mean, we were getting calls. There was there was a demand for it, and we did it. I have today a couple of three and four year olds that started, and I want to say um, some of the oldest that are still here are are sixteen, seventeen. So you know, almost grown, and they've sticked with it. Oh, but awesome. I know that there are so many three and four year olds that start as just another kid activity, maybe in replace of t-ball or flag football or gymnastics or dance and it's just a short-term activity they want to do for six months try it out and then they quit how have you started when you were three and i know a few other people that have done that and you're still doing it today that longevity that perseverance yeah. man just stick with it <clears throat> you know what kept me in and what keeps people in now at that age you know that they're, they're they're not quite the same uh, my school was, was incredibly traditional, you know, even, even testing for my yellow belt, uh, I still had to hold a horse dance for 15 minutes, uh -huh. you know, at age six, I wasn't progressing terribly fast, but you know, I, the expectation was the same regardless of age, you know, you still had to know your form. The curriculum did not change, uh, for age eight, I had to hold a horse dance for an hour at, for blue belt, right? Like that's not going to work in the modern landscape. And I'm, I'm hyper aware of that. But you talk about these, these young kids now, and if you can give them a good impression, right? Like it's not about setting them up for life necessarily, but if the parents and the kids have a good experience, maybe they come back in a year or two. Right. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, the average three and four year old, not only do they, they not know their left and their right, they just fall down for no reason. <laughs> they can just stand there and lose their balance and just flop over because right, right. their body is still developing. Yeah, yeah. So instead of yeah. trying to teach them, you know, intense curriculum, can they have fun and can they learn literally anything, whether it's martial arts or proprioception or how to pay attention? All of these things. I mean, you, you yeah. mentioned the choir here. They're all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's correct, man. My instructor did the same thing. He didn't really necessarily teach age appropriate is the term that's used it didn't matter if you and we didn't teach three-year-olds then but it didn't matter if you were eight or 30 you were expected to do the the same things learn the certain amount of katas and self-defense drills and the physical training and even history i mean it was pretty deep pr pretty traditional as well but um we've learned that you just you, you can't and you probably shouldn't do that as much now at a three and four like you said let's focus on their fine motor skills less their attention span their focus some of those life skills sure they're gonna learn some basic martial art moves and just get used to some protocol and have fun you know so somewhere along the line fun became a part of martial arts <laughs> early on it necessarily wasn't always that it could have been pretty brutal with a traditional way versus a little bit more i guess you could call it modern thinking you know it, you know i think it was still fun but it was it was what some people call type two fun, right? It's fun. It's fun in retrospect. It's yeah, not right. Fun right. in the moment. Yeah. But I think fun is such a critical aspect. You know, I, I have a, a fundamental belief that everything we do is based on value exchange. For example, I'm doing this show with you now because I think this is a better use of my time in this moment than anything else that I have the opportunity to do. I want to do this. Not everybody wants to come to martial arts for the same reasons. So we try to check those boxes. We try to give them value in exchange for their time, energy, their money. And fun is such a big piece of that. You can you can have a, a, a terrible martial arts curriculum with poor instruction and a dirty facility, but if you find a way for everybody to have fun, they'll keep coming back. Mm -hmm. You can not check the fun box have all of those other things. And if there's absolutely zero enjoyment in it, no one comes back. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we use a lot now about, and, and, and I've learned more to see how a martial arts academy, just like 
you know, so many other things, businesses, relationships, families. Um, you build a culture and, you know, if that culture has some dynamics of fun and excitement, then that's what you're going to get. And if you want a militant culture of just hardcore discipline with a little different approach, then you, you're able to kind of build your, your culture, I believe, there, you know, because people do come for different reasons and get different results. No, good thing you stuck through that because there were a lot of people that would have quit. Even in my shoes, there were a lot of people that, that would have quit. I see people that are, are really good at things, but they don't like it. You know, we have that you should have, could have thing, right? This guy could have been in the NFL. This guy could have and should have been UFC world champion. Because maybe they had natural ability. It was just easy for them, you know, where, how good they were at something. But if they didn't have a passion, a deeper why, a purpose, or love for that, then how are they going to have fun, right? So I think the secret to being good and staying with something, at least, is like we keep saying, to enjoy it enough, you know, what, what happens with these people that are, are so natural? It's almost like they belong in that, you know, but they just don't enjoy it and they, they quit, they burn out. Yeah. One of the things I, I've seen, and I've seen this in a number of schools, and I'm, I'm pretty blessed I get to travel around and, and train with a, a whole bunch of different people at this point in my career. And you've been teaching long enough, you're going to know the type of person I'm talking about. They start, they usually start seven, eight years old and they are advanced in terms of their physical abilities from their peers. And they stand out and they seem really good and they progress quickly. But because they progress quickly, they don't develop the discipline and the willingness to not be great at something. They hit a point at seems to be 10, 11, 12 in there for quite a few of them, where all of a sudden their natural talent doesn't carry them forward mm -hmm. and they quit. And I see instructors all over the place. Look, but they were so good. Right, right. They were so good. But they weren't good at one of the things that the kids who start and they completely stink get really good at, which is a comfort with the discipline of showing up and not being great at something the first couple of times you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's that a uh, natural ability versus acquired ability, right? Absolutely. And although, you know, this guy might start way up here so much ahead of everyone, while this this one least likely to succeed type is way back here, but consistency, persistency, and just continue and continue. And either this person just falls off or that other one just eventually once they catch up, they're able to pass them, you know? And I think they're able to pass them because of the passion. You know, it's got to, it's got to, it's got to just be passion and, you know, things that they're doing outside. You see a lot of natural ability, talented people, athletes, they don't have to practice that much, you know, right? They can, you know, even from adults, you know, they, they can party that night before and do whatever and, uh, and still perform pretty well. And you see these people that are acquiring the ability, but they're the ones that will go above and beyond and put in the extra reps, the extra practice, and they do eventually seem to pass up a lot of people don't they? they they do and you know we have these fantasies of of natural talent taking people to the the absolute top but it's so rare that that works out you know you look at any of your professional sports i, th I think gives us a better insight into work ethic and skill because we have a larger body to work from and the fact that so much of martial arts is subjective you know you i, I don't care who you consider to be the best let's say basketball player of all time they're a handful of people that uh, people generally go to, every single one of them was known for their work ethic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can say the same thing about football. You can say the same thing about baseball. You can say the same thing about any professional sport, that the absolute best of the best have a really good relationship with hard work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, the, the, the work ethic, the things they do. and with um, technology and knowledge and just able to supplement so many other things. So now that you, you realize, oh, I can be better if I sleep correctly. I can be better with the right, you know, uh, diet, nutrition, and, you know, cross-training exercises and things, you know. Never thought yoga would help me in my martial arts. Well, why not, you know? Uh, so many other things like that. Cross-training, I think mixed martial arts uh, created a lot of that you know, people understanding how, how cross training, you know, if it's weightlifting and running and you, you, whatever, whatever it may be, um, not just necessarily doing 
martial arts over and over. But you do hear a lot that, you know, if you want to be good at that one thing, you do that one thing. You want to be good at kicking, you just work on kicking. And sure, yeah, but there are ways to assist outside of that that's going to help. It may maybe uh, create uh, less burnout because burnout's a real thing. Sure. And the other yeah. thing to keep in mind, of course, with what we do, you spend all that time on kicking, something else is going to degrade. Yeah, right. You know, uh, the, the further we get, the more there is to know, the less likely it is that you're going to progress at everything simultaneously. Stuff's going to fade. So you yeah. have to be choosy about wh where your time goes. And maybe it's not just kicking. Maybe it's a lot of kicking. Mm -hmm. And you, st you, you put in the time in the other places to make sure those don't fall back too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's more important to be good at all aspects than just mastering one thing and to grow those things. It's, it's easier to kind of grow them together. You know, if you wanted to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu on Monday and Wednesday and Muay Thai kickboxing on Tuesday and Thursday, you're kind of growing them. Or you could look at that. Well, let me do BJJ for five years and then do Muay Thai for five years. Well, you're not growing them at the same time. You know, you're gonna gonna lose things. Yeah. But it's also about your why. You know, why are you training? What are you trying to do with that? If you're, you know, you're you're picking out BJJ and Muay Thai, which is a pretty common combination for full contact competition, right? And if that's if that's the goal, you probably do want to figure out how to work those out simultaneously because you're gonna need them simultaneously. Right. But if you want it. Shotokan or Tai Chi or a, a traditional martial art where you could focus on that one thing in that art and you knew your why was for you know what whatever you sold into or, or the benefits that you gained you know then that's if, a if different your goal way. is uh, let's say collecting rank you know some, somebody's got a goal you know I want a black belt in this and that and the mm -hmm. other you're probably across calendar time going to achieve that faster if you focus on one thing and dedicate all of your effort to that and then move on to the next one right right getting a black belt at a time not trying to get multiple multiple black belts but maybe just getting the knowledge yeah yeah uh, what's your thoughts on competition there's there's always debates on competing or not of course there's many different types of competition that could be very philosophical or as well just you know literal but uh, competition in general, kids, adults, martial artists? I think competition is absolutely wonderful for a variety of reasons. Most of the time, competition brings out something in us that we do not see elsewhere. And of course, one of the great debates in our space is about being prepared to utilize our skills in a un unintentional confrontation, right? Some manner of assault, robbery, whatever, the need to defend ourselves. Competition for most people brings up adrenaline in a way that you're not going to see in training. It's a stranger. There's something on the line, right? We're being, we're putting pressure on ourselves at the same time other people are putting pressure on, on us and people are watching. And a lot of people that have been training for a long time freeze up. Mm -hmm. So I think, well, not that there aren't other benefits, my number one benefit that I see in competition is learning to condition that adrenaline response within us in a way that is really difficult to suss out elsewhere. But of course, on top of that, you meet other people, you experience other things. It gives you mm -hmm. something to work towards. Most of us struggle with things that we do indefinitely. And of course, martial arts hopefully is something we're doing indefinitely. But if you've got your eye on you know, this competition or that competition circuit, and I'm trying to bring home an overall championship or whatever it is, it can be a little bit easier to wrap our heads around working on something that's a little bit more of a tangible goal. Right. Yeah. And and with the balance, right? I I think I can speak, you know, myself. I I, I can admit there was a time early on, man, it was too much about competition where, you know, we were either just a, a competition school, a tournament school, a fight gym, if you will. There were times where literally for probably 20 25 years i was at a tournament almost every weekend you know and there's a lot of sacrifice in that there was a lot of benefits as well we still compete but nothing like that extreme you know and i competed in any way there was a way to compete in martial arts and learned a lot learned a lot about myself you know spent a lot of time and money in other places but like you said the benefits i still have some some of my best friends are people that i grew up in the martial arts with and competed with as well as those i competed against 
Maybe there were times where we were rivals, man. I didn't like this dude, right? But we became friends, mutual respect, uh, traveling with teams, you know, your students and getting to know the parents. That's back to building a culture. So there were a lot of, there were a lot of pros and cons of the tournament circuit, the competition type school that's too heavy on competition. So I definitely see there's a better uh, yin and yang in the middle there, right? You know, because you're going to have to make some choices. And, you know, I decided I want to spend a little bit more time on some realistic uh, self-defense, some variety, some BJJs. And, and that just takes a lot of time instead of, you know, always preparing for that. I like how you're saying about the adrenal stress and handling yourself under pressure. I love it when I see it. Um, and sometimes how you were saying, like, maybe you judge a student, like, man, this dude's going to be amazing. And then he's just not they just quit or something versus that one that you didn't quite recognize is the student who comes and becomes amazing in competition it's easy to kind of judge this is going to be the first place winner and then sometimes it's not right for many reasons but to see someone that really did not believe in their self and they hold that medal or that trophy and to be teary-eyed and to be so proud of their self that they didn't know they had it in them so it's great to see those positive benefits of competition. Now we could, I don't, I'm not one to get into a lot of negativity, but there is a lot of that as well. If it's politics, if it's uh, parents, you know, a whole other discussion dealing with, with, with competition and traveling martial art teams. But um, so it's a cool, it's a cool thing, man. I, I've got some great friends, as you said, some of my, my best friends in the martial arts are people that I met in competition. In fact, the very first person when when whistle kick launched, the first person that stepped up and said, I will help is someone that I knew not well, but knew of him because some of the students that he trained with two states away, we were rivals. And so I've always known who he was. We're great friends now. But yeah, we had this kind of relationship going back to when we were kids. Whistle kick might not be here if it were not for the relationships I built when I was competing as a team. Right. It's kind of fun to think about it in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you get like-minded individuals that can communicate. I have people that, you know, they're not my competition. They're not in my town, right? And we'll uh, brainstorm together, network. We'll call up if it's working on a seminar, if it's working on a business, you know, concept or something as well as we support each other but i met these guys through competition they're like hey i have so and so celebrity or legend martial artist coming to my gym you guys want to be invited you know because promoting karate tournaments promoting seminars events it's it's almost like a kid going to different birthday parties right right <laughs> you, you go to their you want them to come to your birthday party so you go to their birthday party and you just start collaborating mm -hmm. uh, meeting meeting a lot of different people through the martial arts it's yeah. all about relationships. Everything we do is about relationships. You know, I, I, the most I've learned from any, from instructors, I learned more because when I had a better relationship with them and I don't necessarily mean friendship, but the relationship is the foundation. If some, if you have a good relationship with a student, you know, you can quote, get away with more, with pushing them in a way that they might not be comfortable. But if you don't have that strength of relationship, they're not going to be as receptive to you pushing them, challenging them in a way that you know they need, but they're not ready. Mm -hmm. So as we build those relationships, you know, birthday party exchange or tournament exchange or seminar exchange, right? It all stems from those relationships we're able to build. Right, right. Yeah, relationships, rapport. Uh, you know, martial arts teaches us how to communicate better, how to understand. Should be some empathy you know, as well with everything else. I mean, we run some pretty busy martial arts schools and I don't um, teach, or I couldn't teach all the classes every day at, 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 you know, the academies, but I can go and jump in and teach a class. I might go in and there's a group of 25 kids out there that I don't really know, you know? So I have to, at the same time, always be aware enough to know what I can maybe say or do and, you know, start slow. Well, let's build a little rapport, let, let me, get to know you and you get to know me because my way is slightly different than the other instructor's way and yeah. you know not to freak kids out it's how kids act at school sometimes when there's a substitute teacher all of a sudden mm -hmm. right so they have a different type of behavior 
versus you build a lot of rapport and connection with a martial arts instructor. That can be good. I've also seen times where uh, uh, then a martial arts instructor leaves and the students were so attached to that instructor, you know, so where is it then where, well, let's be attached to the martial arts. You know, that was a great person you can learn a lot from, but here's another one that you can learn a lot from. If there's a qualified martial arts instructor in front of you, I mean, you know, are you more there for that instructor or are you there more for the, for the art itself, right? Mm. It's, it's trip. pretty typical. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it. I've certainly seen it, whether it, we're talking about uh, a martial arts school or a gymnastics school, a CrossFit gym. If, if there's a trainer, trainer, instructor, coach that people love, if that person moves on, there will always be a chunk that if they can, they will follow them. But regardless, there's a chunk that will just kind of fall off because they built that relationship with that person it can be really difficult professionally speaking to overcome that you know requires people filling in and and doing things that you know are are logistically complex Mm -hmm. yeah let me ask a couple questions maybe just some rapid things that come to mind i'd like to see uh, these are common questions asked um of course but uh, I, I know I have different answers and, um, you know, we're, we're all different, but, and there's a lot of even tricky questions, but let's go with some of the common things. What's the best martial arts style and why? There is no best martial arts style. In fact, I find that question when people pose that question, and I, I suspect you are asking it with a degree of sarcasm, yeah. but in fact, when people even make that claim or when people genuinely who know the martial arts world ask that question. I think it is the most offensive thing that we can do. I think there is no question that has been asked over the past however many decades that has set martial arts back more than the notion of style versus style. Uh, I love that answer. Yeah, that's that's true. What's the best martial arts age to start martial arts? The best age? Right now. Ah, good one. I, I like that one a lot. There you go. All right, best martial arts technique. If I had to know one martial arts technique, which one should I learn? Are we going to count running away as a martial arts technique? Nah, that don't count. I like it. Basics, right? The, the foundation Always of the basics. basics. Yeah. Always comes back to the fundamentals. Yeah. Good, 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 good answers. I like those. And, 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 and I agree, you know, it's a combination. Um, basics, man, these students sometimes, you know, you've probably heard as well. Man, we're learning some of the same things over and over, which but some of the things that maybe Todd's like, man, if you only knew, if you only knew how it was to sit in a horse stance and throw, you know, reverse punches, forward punches over and over. Now that's over and over. If you only knew, well, you're learning quite a variety. And to you, it's the over and over. When are we going to learn something new? You know, we uh, compare that to the, the, the microwave world, we want it faster and we want it yesterday, right? More, more, more. So what do we do about, we're tired of doing the same thing over and over? When somebody says that, when a kid says, when are we gonna learn something new? They're actually saying, or a person, doesn't have to be a kid, but it's usually a kid who speaks up. The adult doesn't speak up, they just quit. When someone asks that question, they're actually saying, I'm bored. This is not fun. And so come back to the beginning of, of our conversation. If you make it fun, kids will sit down and play the same video game days on end. It's the same thing. When am I going to play a new video game? No, they're enjoying that game because there is variation as they progress. They enjoy playing whatever it is, doing whatever it is with variation. So to me, the question, when are we going to do something new is likely a sign that the instructor needs some additional coaching on adding variation to what and how they're doing things. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I tell my staff all the time, it's presentation, you know? It's not necessarily what you teach, it's how you teach it. Uh, Popular terms, disguised repetition, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we might do the same thing over and over, but all of a sudden you put the kids, they're working, uh, I don't know, a jab cross front kick, you just, put them in another direction, in another line. You have them doing it on this pad instead of that pad, in the air, with their eyes closed, with this, with that. So then they don't really realize that they're doing the same thing over and over. So maybe it's not that 
They're doing the same thing over and over. Maybe it's they're doing it the same way over and over. And that could be a very uh, helpful way. And I think that could help people that are bored with anything else in life. You know, going to the gym can get very boring if you're doing squats, bench press, and treadmill every time you go to the gym. But get a new workout, get a new routine, change the order, change the reps, you know. We had a lot of the exact same warm-ups when I came up. I already knew how many jumping jacks it was going to be and how many push-ups and how many sit-ups and, you know, how many forward punches, outward blocks, inward blocks, high blocks, low blocks, front kick, side kick, round kicks. That was the basic warm-up, and it didn't really change. Now, I appreciate it. I'm glad I went through it because it made my basic foundation strong and developed but it is harder today i'm talking like an old man i guess but these kids today you know it's always wanting something um, new and different and you know but but i like that is because you're bored with it so we got to find something exciting change up the way we're doing it or what about reward um positive praise and award for that i mean isn't that why they do so well in the video games is to get to the next level Again, it comes back to right value exchange. So if the if the 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 person in question, you know, let, let's call it kid, because I think it's an easier scenario to understand. We've seen it more often with kids. Kids are a lot more willing to say, "I'm bored. This isn't fun," etc. If we take a look at that situation, praise creates value, right? We we are awarding you praise. You know, whether it's uh, a participation trophy, which you know. I'm not a fan of, but yeah. we can offer encouragement. There's value there to the child. We can give them a new technique. We can have them do it facing a different direction. It's all value, not all equal value. And different people, different kids are going to find different value in different things. But it often comes back to the instructor too. Quite often, the instructor of a class, if the students are bored, the instructor's bored. Mm-hmm. I, have, I can't tell you the last time, and, and I don't have my own school. I, I travel around, I train, and so there's a bit of novelty when I show up somewhere regardless. But over the years, I've been a recurring instructor at various schools. I never once had a kid tell me they were bored. I left those classes with, a, I was hoarse. My, my voice was scratchy. I gave them everything I had. If you put the energy in, so will they. Yeah. If you don't, they won't. And that's where I think a lot of instructors who are maybe passionate about martial arts, not passionate about instruction, fall into that trap because they want martial arts to be their job, Mm -hmm. but they don't throw in the energy and they get bored and the students get bored and now everybody's spiraling downwards and the students look at the instructor and the instructor looks at the students and say, well, you know, it's your fault. Mm Yeah, yeah. There's a difference. You know, I try to I try to use and think of and preach on on the word obsessed. And when you're in that class, man, if it's a 30 minute or an hour and a half class, whatever you're teaching, how obsessed are you with them getting real progress, getting the technique right? Now you got to be careful. There's so much cycle and understanding of teaching, communicating, but you know, not to overcorrect, but not to leave it uncorrected and um, you know, to praise at the right time and then to to, to notice the improvement or to find ways. The way you said it just didn't click. Well, let me say the same thing differently. Our analogies, our examples, you know, and uh, really, uh, it, you know, it's a tough world. People are going through a lot of things, kids and adults. And if we can make that class the best part of their day, we did something right. But like you said, you were so passionate that your voice was, you know, you were losing your voice. I mean, you were tired. You needed to chill for a minute because you got done working, but working and getting results and benefits. And, you know, we say what comes from the heart touches the heart. You were really able to empower lives. And that's what we want to do. Teaching new instructors that it's, it, it takes some training. It takes some time. And um, sometimes they don't have it. Sometimes they do. The number one thing I think instructors need to keep in mind, because everything will, if they put in the time, right, they put in the the reps of teaching, if they remember that people aren't trying to get it wrong, that they're not trying to be bad at things, that they are maybe not doing their absolute best, but they are putting effort in. Nobody wants to be bad at things. Right. I don't care. You You could take the kid who has the least interest being there 
their parents force them to show up, they still don't want to be bad at it. They still want some recognition out of it. And if you can remember that, if you can remember that they're there, maybe not by their own choice, but they're trying to find their own version of success within the parameters you're giving them, it tends to work out. That's right, yeah. It may just be a low self-esteem. So what, what you think is not trying is just um, some issues that they're dealing well with on lack of confidence. And if it's our, our duty, I wouldn't say job, if it's our responsibility to build their confidence and raise that self-esteem through time, uh, to let them see progress, you know, they thought they could kick this high, but they really could kick that high, whatever it may be, then we do what we're, what we're supposed to do. You know, not all great martial artists are great instructors. I've also had the privilege of traveling all over, I'm not going to say any names, but training with some of the absolute best in the world of martial arts. But then when they were teaching, we're not maybe the best instructor. And then you see it the other way around, right? Yeah. yeah. I've known wonderful martial arts instructors who, if you were to evaluate them based on their skill, would say, you know, they're okay. They've put in their time. They have competency, but they are not exceptional doing. They're exceptional at teaching. And quite often, the inverse, the problem with the inverse is because People have put in the time. They forget what it's like to be crummy at something. And they get in front of a room, especially of people that they don't know. I think we've all experienced this. Go to certain seminars and, yeah, this person's amazing. I'm going to learn so much. And they just look at you. Why can't you do this? This is so basic. Well, it's not basic to me. It's basic to you because you've done it 100 million times. Help me get it better at it. They don't know how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's having a lack of empathy are being a white belt again, or at least seeing as a black belt, seeing in white belt eyes, you know? I remember when I couldn't rotate on that kick like that. I remember this, you know? But you, you, I bet some people may forget that they were like that, right? Because they're a superstar now, but they didn't start off as a superstar, right? I felt I think that white belt mindset is so absolutely critical. If you've been in the front of the room for 20 years, you forget what it's like to be in the back of the room. I love being yeah. in the back of the room. Yeah. There's no responsibility and everything is open. Yeah. I just get yeah. to learn when I'm in the back of the room. And I, I just think it's such a, a freeing place to be. And so that's, I, that's I, I challenge instructors. If, if, you, if you're not learning, if you're not a student, if you're always in the front of the room facing the students, you're not getting better. Your skills are not progressing. You might be becoming a better version of what those skills are, but where's the new information coming in? Mm -hmm. All the more reason to go, I don't care what it is, go train something, it doesn't even have to be martial arts. Remember what it's like to be in the back of the room and anxious and not quite know how this is supposed to go. What am I supposed to do? Where do my hands and feet go? Mm -hmm. Martial yeah, artists, uh... go take a dance class. Right, 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 yeah. You know, I, I competed so much and then just, just kind of stopped competing and I really missed it. So I started getting into some other things, started doing some bodybuilding, some Spartan races. Now I go and now I go and train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but I go an hour and a half away. And when I walk in there uh, to be a student, to be a beginner, you know, and it, I don't have to do anything. Now, at first, it kind of freaked me out. I remember sitting in there and the phone rang. It's not my school. <laughs> almost got up to answer it. Or the toilet overflowed and I almost went to go fix it. Or you see students doing things wrong and you want to go teach them. And I'm like, oh, I'm not the teacher. I'm just going to be quiet. I'm going to be a student. And I really learned to embrace that. And man, what a what a peaceful moment it is <laughs> just to worry about being a student. But you can make yourself better and then you're able to add some skills and then come back and speak from some different experiences to then help the students you have. Yeah, I mean, you can't give up or, or stop like the end. How many times do you hear, I can't wait till I get my black belt and then I'm done. Oh man, or you know, they're gonna test for their black belt and they're done. And we could probably talk two options there. I mean, yeah, that was your goal, you said it, congratulations. But I sure hate to hear that. There is so much more after that, you know? It's our fault. They say that because we've told them that that's the goal. 
uh, black belt, black belt, black, black belt's belt. the goal. Get your black belt. Here, I'm going to I'm going to say a phrase right now that some people probably use and it's going to offend them. We're a black belt school. Mm-hmm. What we do you use this? It's, it's in You're our telling student them there's creed. An end point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you truly yeah. don't believe there's an end point, don't tell them there's an end point. In fact, I believe over the next 20 years, I don't quite know what it's going to look like. I think we're going to have a shakeup in the industry about rank. I think between recognition that that is not serving us and some people getting frustrated at what they perceive to be the dilution of rank, I think some schools are going to go off and and start doing things a little bit differently. I don't know exactly what that's going to be, Mm -hmm. but I think the foundation is set. Yeah. Yeah, there should be a vision of, of what's after Black Belt. We've talked about that. I have a good friend who paints a good vision of, you know, after Black Belt, second, third, fourth, the, you know, what, what does he say all the time? Uh, this is Grandmaster Al Garza, a good friend of mine. I, I might mess up what he says, but uh, it starts with the a Black Belt is a white belt that never quit. You know, what is a second degree black belt? And you could go on and on. What's a first degree that never quit? And then what is a master? What is a grandmaster? You know, a black belt that never quit on and on and on. Painting a vision and a picture of, of what's after a black belt that you don't. Because I think people see it as a degree almost. You know, they got their their master's degree and they're done, right? Well, you know. And, and, and that's why I come back to it. value and fun. If someone quits after black belt, they weren't actually having fun. They weren't having as much fun as they're having doing the thing that they went to go do. Right. Or why are they ready to quit? If it's yeah. fun first, if they're not having fun, you know, we see this, right? It's fun as they have the new material because the instructors don't quite know how to make it fun. So they reward with new material. And I, many, I'm not going to say most, many martial arts instructors have said, you know, this person's on the fence for testing or for promotion or however it's it's run in their school. I know if I don't let them test or promote them in this cycle, they're going to quit. So I'm going to I'm going to push them up and I'm going to hope that whatever the thing that's holding them back changes. It never changes. And so that most schools run out of most of the new material somewhere in that red brown phase and they expect a lot of refinement for black belt. And that's where it stops being fun for a lot of people. Yeah. And they push forward because they've already put in the time. They might as well, quote, finish this. And then they finish it. Yeah. 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 I'll, I will fail people at advanced levels, uh, you know, brown, red, black, but I may call it retest. <laughs> you know, we'll retest on this or that wordage and all of that's important. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me uh, maybe see, uh, Mr. Jeremy, if you have anything you'd like to close with or add. Um, it's, it's been a great discussion. You know, if anything, I had curious is what's, what's your advice on the parent side of their kids in the martial arts? You know, dealing with parents is a big issue. This could be an entire episode alone with uh, dealing with parents, and there's all types of them. And, uh, you know, I love our parents, but there's um the places most schools fall down with parents is not properly setting expectations i believe wholeheartedly parents and anyone dropping off a student if they're going to remain supervising if that's the culture of the school that there's a a parent a guardian overseeing you know just kind of watching from afar they should sign a contract this is what we expect of you you know and maybe it's it's a, a a nice way of saying sit there and shut up and let us do our job. But maybe there are other expectations. Maybe the expectation is not, hey, I don't want you to talk to your kid about whether they did a good or bad job with X technique or this thing. You know, you can be broad in general, but maybe, maybe you don't want them needling on the ride home because maybe you have a plan because let's face it, most parents have never, have not trained or if they trained, it was years ago. They don't have the knowledge. And the very fact that they're bringing the kids to you suggests that you they acknowledge you have something they don't. So if you can get on the same page with them about what those expectations are, and I, I am always a fan of, it doesn't have to be a super formal contract with attorneys involved, but just a bulleted sheet. This is what mm-hmm. we expect of our parents. If you want the best from your kid out of the classes that we teach, this is what you should do. This is what you should not do. 
Right, right. Give us your support. Let's work as a team, strengthen numbers. But here's the boundaries. Let me do my job. This is my mat. I know this or that. I will decide who has a part in the demo, who's going to compete, you know, uh, who's going to promote, who's going to test, why this kid promoted, why this one didn't, you know. We Don't can correct from the sidelines, but, things like yeah, that. And you have to, yeah. just as you have to hold your students accountable, you have to hold the parents accountable. Right. If it's happening, you have to tell them. If they're not willing to change the behavior, they have to go because in letting them persist, it gives permission to the other parents yeah. to break the contract. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've seen and dealt with all sides of it, and sure it can be have. tough, but it but it is uh, but it is important, you know, because they deal with it outside on other things where it's uh, acceptable, you know, the soccer mom coaching, the the dance parent, and the politics of all of that uh, reality shows. So then they think that's how it works in martial arts too. Well, it's a little different in martial arts. Yeah, it shouldn't sure. exist in those other places either. No, I don't think anybody does. wants to yeah. be one of those dance moms on the reality shows. Right, Ooh, right. Not anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I've seen them. Um, well, uh, anything to add or conclude with? No, no. Thanks for having me on. This was fun. I, I, I love talking martial arts. I, I could talk martial arts probably eight hours a day if you let me. I'm, I'm pretty lucky. A big part of my, quote, job is talking about martial arts with various people. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the could same. Could have kept, and, kept uh, going for hours. Right, right, right. Yeah, me too. Well, well, congratulations and keep it up. You're doing great things, uh, Mr. Jeremy. Uh, you guys, if you haven't already, go and uh, follow the Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio podcast and check out the things that Whistle Kick and Mr. Jeremy and his crew um, are doing. Uh, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. And let's stay in touch. We'll talk again. Sounds great. Appreciate your time. Right. Thank you. Thank you.